We're going to be in uh, Revelation 13, starting in verse number 1. And the dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten, thorn, ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but had feet like those of a bear, and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was astonished and followed the beast. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. He opened his mouth to blasphemy God and to slander his name in his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. He who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth. He had two horns like a lamb, but he spoke like a dragon. He exercised all the authority of the first beast on his behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast, whose fatal wound had been healed. And he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. He also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast for it is man's number. His number is 666. This is the word of the Lord. All right, here we go. Revelation chapter 13. You ready for this one? I think we better pray. Let's pray. Lord, Lord, thank you so much for today. And just to be together as your people. And just so thankful for your word and what we just continue to learn and receive from you through your word. Let it happen again today, Lord. I pray for those maybe you've never heard you or sensed you speaking to them. Let it happen today. Lord, give them ears to hear, as we just read, to hear you, hear from you, the living God who loves them so much. Lord, I pray that we would all be people whose hearts are dedicated to you, who live for you, who love you more than anything else. Lord, let us be people who worship you, true worshipers, Lord, of you in spirit and in truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. And in spite of our friend Taylor's request, we do ask that, maybe you didn't hear me before, Lord, but help, help the sons win today. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I had to. I couldn't not. Hey, by the way, next Sunday is going to be a very fun, different, significant Sunday. We're going to tackle a very interesting and very important topic next Sunday. You don't want to miss next Sunday here, okay? Just mark my words on that. So I just want to say that before we dive into Revelation 13. Here we go. We're talking about the Antichrist a little bit more, and we're talking about that crazy thing called the mark of the beast. You ever heard of this thing? Yeah, of course you had. Everyone's heard of 666 at the very least, whether they knew that was connected to the mark of the beast or not. We've heard about that, this crazy evil number. You know, there's a lot of people that really get freaked out by this stuff. People get freaked out by this chapter of Revelation and especially those last few verses in in this chapter. And can I just say this from the very beginning? Prophecy was not meant to scare us, but to prepare us. 
And so I want to help put some fears at rest. Some of you might uh, have some fears about some of this and the mark of the beast and all that kind of stuff. We're going to have some fun uh, looking at this here today. I want to help put your fears to rest. Maybe you know people that are afraid and, and we just avoid anything that could potentially have any identification with the mark of the beast and 666 and all that kind of stuff. Uh, prophecy was meant to prepare us. And so, remember, Revelation is the Greek word apocalypsis. That word means to, um, to it means what is revealed or a disclosure. So God is revealing things to us in Revelation that he wants us to know. So there's some things he wants to prepare us for. He wants us to be ready. And first and foremost, what we see clearly as we're trying to decipher all the, the details, we see Jesus is coming back. So... Uh, in the very beginning, actually, of Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, we see a very, very clear, uh, I would say, synopsis of the book of Revelation. Jesus says to John, he says, Write, therefore, what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place later. So right there in one verse, you see, that's what Revelation is about. There are some things that Jesus wanted to speak to the first century church specifically, and also, here's some things that are going to happen later on. And so that's really a synopsis of what Revelation is, is all about. So the, the words that were spoken directly to the first century church really minister to us today still. But then there's this future stuff, things that still haven't happened. Yet what we do know is this. As we struggle to, to figure out the timeline and all this, you know, is it pre-trib, uh, mid-trib, post-trib? You know, a lot of you fall into the pan-trib. It'll all pan out in the end. And whatever happens, that's, that's what happens, right? We know Jesus is coming back. He is coming back. He said himself, I will be coming back. Why Jesus is coming back is more important than when and how Jesus is coming back. So that we're not getting caught up in the when and the how. We're having a little bit of fun talking about what it could look like, what it might be. We don't know when, by the way. Jesus says there's no way. You can't know when. Like, we can see some signs, and those signs will show us it's getting close, but we still don't know when. We can't put dates to it how we're trying to decipher that as best as we possibly can. All of that is good and fun, but the most important thing is why is Jesus coming back? And he's coming back because he loves his people. He wants to come back and, and, and gather his believers, and he's not coming back to destroy the earth. That's not what Revelation is. Revelation is all about redemption. It's about the redeeming of mankind and the redeeming of the earth. He is going to establish his reign and his rule on this earth. And we who are with him will experience life the way we long to experience. No death, no pain, no drama, no disease. None of that stuff in perfection for all of eternity. And that sounds good, especially right about now. So that's why Jesus is coming back. Man, he loves you. And he wants you to be with him for all of eternity. So it's important that we understand that, especially as we approach this topic here today. And so what I want to talk about today is worship. What are you worshiping with your life? What you worship is basically what you center your life around. Like, I live for this, and so I will rearrange my schedule, my finances, my family around all of this. That's whatever that, that the center of your life and your schedule and all that. The center of your heart, that is what you worship. And the truth is we all worship something or someone. Everybody does. We are created to worship. It's what we do. Whether we realize it or not, we are worshipers. So who or what you worship has this, uh, determines your experience in life, and it also determines your eternal life. So this is what we're looking at today. Who or what you worship determines your experience in life, but it also determines your eternal life. So let's talk about worship. Who am I worshiping? What am I worshiping today? And my hope is that all of us would put our trust and our faith in Jesus and we'd worship him. That's why we were made and that's how we were made. So let's go to Revelation 13, verse one. We're gonna have fun walking through this chapter. We're not gonna hit every verse in it, but we'll hit most of them. Verse one, and the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. Who's the dragon? It's the devil. It's Satan. And it says, I saw a beast coming out of the sea. He had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on his horns. And, each, and on each head, a blasphemous name. So what we see here in this chapter is this beast coming out of the sea. And then later on, did you catch that? There's another beast. There's two beasts. You got the sea beast and you got the earth beast. The sea beast is the Antichrist. The earth beast is 
the false prophet. So we'll talk about the false prophet uh, later on, but let's look at the sea beast here. Let's look at the Antichrist. He has ten horns, ten crowns on his head. That represents ten kingdoms. So the, the Antichrist is going to rally ten kingdoms, ten countries, ten leaders. They're going to develop a coalition. They're going to uh, make peace uh, over the, the whole world, essentially. But their, their ultimate goal is domination. And the Antichrist doesn't want to just bring peace. He wants to rule and reign over the entire earth. And so he's going to start with a coalition of ten kingdoms or ten countries. So who is the Antichrist? It's one of the big popular questions, right? Who is he? Is he alive today? Do we know who he is? Uh, many people think that the whole concept of the Antichrist is kind of silly and, and a waste of time. It sounds good for religious purposes, and it's, it's sensationalistic end-time stuff. You know, a lot of people think that the Antichrist is up there with, like, the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus. It's just good religious stories, but that's not real. And maybe you think that. Maybe you know people who, who think that. I believe the Antichrist is going to come, though. I mean, Jesus... He lived here on this earth. He died. He rose again. He said he's coming back. I believe in all of that. I believe Jesus is coming back. Jesus said he's coming back, and I believe him. And he actually spoke of the Antichrist as well. So I believe that the Antichrist is going to come, and he will rise to power. However it happens, whatever it looks like, it will happen. But throughout the ages, people have always... Uh, wondered and speculated, who is the Antichrist? Is he this guy? Is he this guy? All the way back to the first century. Did you know that? The emperors Caligula and Nero, both of those emperors of Rome, were said to have been the Antichrist, especially Caligula. Right around 50, the year 50, he put up an idol of himself in the temple in Jerusalem. That's like exactly what the Antichrist is going to do. And he did it. And so I know the first century church was thinking, well, that didn't take long. Here we go. Antichrist. <laughs> but then that wasn't the Antichrist. And then Nero came on the scene. Nero was even worse. And then throughout the, all, throughout the centuries, you've had people like Mussolini, Napoleon, most popular one, Hitler, Gorbachev. A lot of people have thought it's one of our U.S. presidents, starting first and foremost with Thomas Jefferson. People thought he was the Antichrist or could have been. Roosevelt, JFK, even Ronald Reagan. A lot of people thought he could be the, the Antichrist. And here's why they thought Ronald Reagan. He, his name is Ronald Wilson Reagan. Three names. And each name has six letters in it. So it's three sixes. There we go. Ronald Wilson Reagan. Six, six, six. There we go. <laughs> Antichrist. Because of that. Some people have thought popes, different popes. Could be the Antichrist. We don't know. We will know. It'll be very clear someday. Right now, it's all speculation. We don't know. He could be alive right now. We don't know. It depends on how close we are to the end. But there's a lot that we know about the Antichrist when it happens. And Scripture actually talks a lot about the Antichrist, surprisingly enough. He's got a lot of names in Scripture. He's the man of sin. He's the lawless one, or the man of lawlessness. He is the beast. He's later on in Revelation, the scarlet beast, the little horn, the prince that shall come. The, the word or title Antichrist is not mentioned, ironically, until towards the end of the Bible. First John is the first time you see Antichrist specifically. And First John is just a few books before Revelation. And so John, probably the same author of Revelation, same John, he writes this. He says, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard, that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. And we see clearly in Scripture that the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work in today's age. So, if this is what John is saying, if this is in the Scripture, the devil has probably tried through other people to raise them up to be the Antichrist. It just hasn't happened yet. But it will happen. Now, when you study the prophecies of the Antichrist, you can see there's good indication of where he will come from. There's three countries in our modern day world that he could potentially come from. Turkey, Syria, or Iraq. It's those three countries right there. Now, he could be a descendant of one of those who's moved and all that. That, that's, that is possible. But when you look at it, it's likely he's going to come from one of those three Modern day countries. And here's what's really fascinating. I don't have time to go into this, but this just blew my mind when I learned this. But study Islam 
end times prophecies and what they believe. And when you read this, it, friends, it is eerily similar to what we read about in the Bible. It's just opposite. And you're like, oh, dear Lord. And so the enemy could very well use an existing religion, and they believe all this stuff's going to happen, but it's, it's so similar but not to what we believe. And it's as if they, and, and that, that stuff could come true, and, but it's not how they thought it was going to come true. This is going to be a little different. They believe Jesus is coming back. And they believe Jesus is coming back to show the world that Islam is a true religion, not Christianity. Because they believe in Jesus. And so it's just, it's interesting when you study that. Um, all that to say, <laughs> the Antichrist will rise to power. He will have authority. He will have authority over the world. Uh, it's a borrowed authority. It's not a real authority. It's a temporary authority, but he will have the authority. And now remember, the word anti doesn't just mean against. It means instead of. He wants to replace Jesus. He wants to be Jesus instead of the real Jesus. That's his goal. Ultimately, the devil wants worship. It's important we understand that. He tried to tempt Jesus to bow down and worship him. That was one of the temptations. He said, Jesus, bow down and worship me, and I'll give you all the power and all the authority. The devil has longed for worship. He wants worship desperately. He will do whatever he can now and in the end times to get worship. That's why it matters who we worship. Because who or what we worship it determines our experience in life, but also it determines our eternal life. So let's go back to chapter 13 here, verse 4. Jump ahead to verse 4. Men worshipped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can make war against him? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise his authority for 42 months. Which again, that's three and a half years, which is half of the seven-year tribulation. He opened his mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. He was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So we can see that the Antichrist truly lives up to his name, right? He has the power here. Over the, whole, over the whole earth. But it says there he has the power to overcome the saints, to overcome the believers. Did you catch that? I was really wrestling with that this week because in the last chapter, last week we looked at how the believers overcame. And they overcame in verse 11, chapter 12, very, very important scripture in the entire Bible. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So they overcame because of what Jesus did for them on the cross. That's the blood of the lamb. Jesus being the lamb, shed his blood. He died on the cross. And allowing Jesus to change their life, living that out, the word of their testimony, they were overcomers. But here now, the next chapter, they're overcome. So I was really wrestling with this. Okay, so they were overcoming, but now they're, they're, they're not overcoming. They're being overcome. So how does this, how do you reconcile this? But then I thought about this. If I'm living in the end times and I believe in Jesus... I'm suffering major intense persecution, and then I die. I'm martyred for my faith. Have I really lost? Did he really overcome me? The moment I step into eternity, and I'm now with Jesus for eternity, I haven't lost, friends. I have overcame still, even in that. So just because we die doesn't mean we've lost. See, we sometimes think that death is the worst thing that could ever happen to us. It's not. As we live for Jesus, we are overcomers. Even in death, we are overcomers. No matter what we go through, we are overcomers. And when we die, it's like really a transition into that eternal reward, that eternal life with him. So I haven't lost. And ultimately, remember this. The devil, he's going to lose in the end. So he might have temporary victories, he thinks, but he's not really an overcomer. Not like God's believers are. That makes sense? Like Jesus talked about this. Let's look at the words of Jesus, Matthew 10. And he has some very important words that speak to this idea. Verse 26, so Jesus says, do not be afraid of them. There's nothing concealed that will be disclosed or hidden that will be made known. Verse 28, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. 
Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Oftentimes, we're so afraid of death, we'll do anything to avoid it. But Jesus is saying, hey, don't worry about that and, and people, what they can do to you. Even they can, No, no, worry about God's opinion of you. <laughs> worry about living for him. Because that's going to affect your eternity, is what Jesus is saying. And then he goes on to say, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Even if you have a few left, he knows the number. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. And then Jesus goes on to say, whoever acknowledges me before man, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. So Jesus very clearly says, don't be afraid of what other people can do to you. Don't worry about that. Don't even worry about what the devil, the enemy can do to you. Even when faced with death, death is not the, 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 the worst thing that can happen to you. In fact, we're all going to experience that. Unless we experience the rapture, we're all going to experience death. It's just a transition. Even in death, because of Jesus, we are overcomers. So don't fear that. Fear God. Live for him. Have a healthy fear, reverence, and live a life that just worships God. It's all about our life and how we live. Living for him. Worshiping him. That's what we're talking about here today, right? Worship. And last week we wrestled with this question, and I want to pose this question again. Do I love Jesus more than I love life itself? And I think this is a very important question for us. Do I love Jesus more than anything else, more than even my life? That's the goal. And if I love Jesus that much, I won't, I won't fear death. But if I have this fear of death, and even other things and what people think of me, it's going to cause me to do things that are going to take me away from Jesus. But if I love him more than anything else, I'm going to seek to please him, be close to him no matter what I go through. So who or what I worship determines the experiences I have in life and my eternal life, right? So moving on, let's look at the earth beast. The earth beast is the false prophet. His role appears to be setting up a really a false church, a worldwide religion that worships the Antichrist. So let's look at a few verses in regards to this earth beast, this false prophet. Verse 14 in Revelation 13. Because of all the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. He ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. He was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that it could uh, speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. Interesting. So in some ways, this false beast is going to mimic or you could say imitate in a lesser version the ministry and the supernatural ministry of the Holy Spirit. What the Holy Spirit does. A lot of people call these three people the unholy trinity. You have the holy trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And you got this unholy trinity that we're seeing played out in real fashion right here in Revelation 13. You got the devil, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And they are waging war against the saints, against the people of God, ultimately against God himself. So that's this false prophet. He set up this, this religion here, this establishment of a worldwide religion. Everyone's going to be forced to worship the beast, the Antichrist. And that's what a false prophet is. You know that? A false prophet is someone who, who pushes people to worship something other than Jesus. So it's funny how people will say, you know, don't, don't listen to this person. Don't listen to this church or this pastor. Don't even sing songs by this church named Hillsong or Bethel. False prophets, false prophets. Mean, it's funny how people will say that. The, the truth is, they just have different doctrine than you. <laughs> just, just because they have different doctrine doesn't mean they're false prophets. False prophets lead people away from Jesus. If they're pointing people to Jesus, they are not a false prophet. They just have different doctrine, Okay. So a false prophet is someone that pulls people away from Jesus, and that's exactly what he's going to do. He's going to set up what is called this abomination that causes 
desolation or desecration. It's this image of the beast in the temple in Jerusalem. That's a very significant moment that we just read about here in Revelation 13. It's so significant that Daniel, hundreds of years before, prophesied it's going to happen. Daniel talked about it, and then Jesus quoted Daniel. He's like, you know when Daniel talked about the abomination that causes desolation? Uh, when that happens, yeah, that's when you know it's all getting ready to shake up. That's it. Okay, the end has come. Okay, there's going to be signs where you know it's coming near, it's coming near. But Jesus points to that one event that Daniel prophesied about, that we're reading about in Revelation 13. Jesus is saying that abomination that caused desolation that's set up in the temple, that's it. You know the end has come. So this is a very significant moment that's taking place here in Revelation 13. Let's keep reading on here about this false prophet. Let's bring this chapter to a close. Verse, uh, verse 16. He also, the false beast, or the false prophet, also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number. His number is 666. Dun, dun, dun. There it is, right there. The number, the mark of the beast. You know, when, when people think of Revelation, this oftentimes is the first thing they think about. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Revelation, that's where that 666 thing, right? Mark of the beast. Like, this is the number one thing that gets to the top. Like, people want to talk about this and discuss this. It's amazing. People who have no church experience know about 666. They might not know anything about it, but they just know that, oh, that's the bad number, right? It's like the devil's number, and it's probably in the Bible. Well, here's where it is. And the funny thing is, this is the only mention in the entire Bible of 666. This is it right here, the only place. Yet, isn't it amazing how much drama and fear surrounds this whole 666 mark of the beast? It's kind of fascinating, isn't it? Now, throughout the years, uh, a lot of believers, Christians have pointed to certain things like, hey, don't do that. It's the mark of the beast. Avoid that. Maybe you've heard some of these. Go back to the 1930s, the creation, the institution of the social security number. When people were given a social security number in the 30s, Christians were like, don't get the social security number. That's the mark of the beast. You got to avoid that. 1973, we're introduced to this thing called the barcode. And a lot of people said, don't use barcodes. Evangelical Christians were, were, were very adamant about this. Uh, there were some people in the first service that were around during the 70s. They were like, they're shaking their leg up. I remember this. Uh, people believed that 666 was in every barcode. So don't use barcodes. Could you imagine not using barcodes when you go to the grocery store today? Okay, it's kind of funny, but it is interesting and sad about how we get worked up about certain things that could be the mark of the beast. Most recent, what's the big one? Don't get the vaccine. It's the mark of the beast. And a lot of conversation, a lot of drama, and a lot of conspiracy around all of this. You know, Bill Gates has got tracking in that, and he's going to be careful with that. Okay, so all this weird, crazy conversations going on. It was even in USA Today. Headline, USA Today, is the vaccine the mark of the beast, and all this kind of stuff. Okay, so it's just interesting how much drama surrounds one verse in Scripture, isn't it? Huh. You know, I heard one guy said, well, I'm going to get the vaccine, but I'll just tell the doctors to put it in my left arm. Because then, it, well, you know, the Bible says right arm and right hand. And so then it won't be the mark of the beast, right? I'm like, yeah. That's one way around it. There you go. <laughs> you think about COVID and the, what we've gone through in this whole pandemic the last couple of years, though, is very interesting. I think about where we were at two years ago as we were all still in lockdown. COVID and the pandemic was such an eerie, weird season. And I'll just never forget, none of us will ever forget all that we went through for the rest of our lives. But what did it show us? It showed us that the world can be unified around something globally. For the first time, in perhaps the most profound way, we saw the world coming together, albeit it was pandemic stuff, but we see, oh, this revelation stuff, it, it, it could very well happen now. It's not a far-fetched, like, Hollywood type of movie thing. Like, we lived a worldwide experience 
all together. And what it, it was tough. It was challenging. It was stressful. It was difficult. There was a lot of loss and heartache in, in the pandemic. But know this, that what we've gone through the last couple of years is going to pale in comparison to what is going to happen in the end times, guys. It's going to get crazier. But the good news is we have Jesus. We've got to keep our faith in Jesus and, and, and look to him through all of this. And so let me just say, you know, there's lots of conspiracy and lots of stuff out there. If it's not clearly in Scripture, be careful what you believe. <laughs> be careful what you listen to. Okay, you listen to some random dude on YouTube, and he's going to influence you to change your whole belief system? Like, seriously? Like, don't, don't make life decisions because of random guy on YouTube. Go to the Word, study the Word. If it's not clearly there, just say, hmm, that's interesting. And don't rearrange your life based upon that. Okay, I feel like I just got to say some of this because people say lots of crazy stuff. They say it because they want to gain influence. They want to sell things. They say it to strike fear. Why, why do people want to strike fear in other people? Because fear sells. And they can, gain, they can get more traction on their, their videos or their books or whatever they're trying to Like fear sells. It makes people money. So they'll take things like this and they'll strike fear into you, friends. Don't be afraid. That's really what I want to encourage you with today. You don't have to fear the mark of the beast. I do not believe you can accidentally take the mark of the beast. So let me give you four truths about the mark of the beast here. Okay, four truths that you need to understand clearly according to Scripture. There's more, but here's four of them. Number one, it will be implemented by a Middle Eastern coalition aligned with the Antichrist. Number two, it will happen after the invasion of Jerusalem. Number three, the death penalty will be associated with it. And number four, it will be an intentional act connected directly to the worship of the Antichrist. Have you seen any of those four things shape up in our world yet? No. Therefore, friends, you do not have to fear the mark of the beast. Now, when that happens, then take note. When you see those four things happen, then you know, okay, it's on. Now, whatever they're going to force us to do next, don't do it. But for now, nothing that I've mentioned that we've experienced in life points to any of those things, especially directly connecting worship of the Antichrist. It's all centers around worship. Who do you worship? That's what it's going to center around in the end. It's going to center around forcing people to worship the Antichrist and the devil. And who you and I worship, it matters, right? Who or what you worship determines your experience in life and your eternal life. I want to encourage you to worship Jesus with everything you got. And when you do, you'll be okay. You know what people get caught up on or tripped up on is the whole idea of you can't buy or sell anything. That's the one thing everyone keys in on, right? You can't buy or sell anything. That's why social security numbers and barcodes and all that kind of stuff, it's like, <gasps> mark of the beast, there it is, see, see? Can't buy or sell anything. And we get like just too emotional and, and crazy about certain things like that. So I think it's safe to say that the technology that will be used potentially for the mark of the beast probably already exists today. It's very likely. Like there are people getting chips in their hands right now to buy and sell things. Did you know that? You see that happening. Uh, in Europe, it's already starting to happen. So people are getting chips. It's just like that chip that you have on your debit card or your credit card. They get that implanted in their hand. Now you don't have to remember your credit card or your debit card. It is great. I just bloop with my own hand because I got a chip in it. Okay, so technology is getting to this place where you could see, oh, that could, that could potentially be it. Does that, mean, does that mean we need to be afraid? No. Let me just throw this idea out there too. The mark of the beast may not even be a physical thing. It may be a spiritual thing centered around who or what you worship. It's very likely, friends, that it's just a spiritual thing that we're getting caught up and worked into a frenzy of. Let me just look at a few things here for us. Revelation 7, verse 3. Look at this. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. So God seals his people on the forehead, apparently. Okay, then you come back to the chapter that we're in. 
chapter 13. Let's look at verse 18. And I love how verse 18 starts. This calls for wisdom. Okay, friends, let me just pray supernatural wisdom over you and I as we process all this crazy end time stuff, okay? Wisdom. This calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast, for it is man's number, is number 666. But let's exercise wisdom as we approach this because it may not be a physical thing. It might be a spiritual thing. And let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 6. Let's go back to the beginning, towards the beginning of the Bible. And look at what God said through Moses to his people. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. This is the great Shema. Jesus quoted this when asked, what's the greatest commandment? And he quoted the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And he said, and in connection to that, love people. So that's how you show that you really do love God. It's, it's, all, it's all one and the same. But Jesus quoted this. This is very, very important for the Jewish people. And he goes on to say, these commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. That's interesting. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So you read that, you look at this, and God is speaking to our hearts. He's saying, let this, my words, my commands, let it get into your heart. I want your heart to just love me with all of your soul, all your strength, everything you got, love me, which really is a call to worship him above everything else in our life. That's the whole point of all this, right? And the Jews, they understood that, but they also loved to take things like literally. And so they literally made these boxes called phylacteries and they would put scripture in it and they would tie them on their arms, on their hands. And they would tie, they would put it on their forehead and they would walk around with scripture in those and they did literally what God has mentioned here. And so that, there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually kind of cool. The whole point is that the word would get into us, that his, his commands and that, can, that we're living for God. It's, about, it's a heart issue. It's not an outward issue, but it became a symbol of identity for them. And so I identify as a follower of God, a believer of God. I'm going to trust in him. I am a worshiper of God. That's why they would wear these phylacteries. Jesus referenced phylacteries, I think, in Matthew 23, specifically about those boxes that they had on their arms and on their forehead. But it was a symbol of identification or of identity of who they belonged to and who they lived for and who they worshiped. It's a spiritual thing, not just a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing, right? And then let's go back to Revelation 13. And let's look at the verse right before the whole 666 verse. Okay, verse 17. And this is what it says. So that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. Did you know that back then they ascribed numbers to letters? And so basically his name in, in numerical form would, would come to 666. And so they're just saying this is just his name. This is the name of the Antichrist. That's the significance of this. It's just his name. And then here's what's fascinating. Here's the part we tend to miss. It's the next verse right after 666. It's in the next chapter, so sometimes we think non-applicable. <laughs> verse 1, chapter 14. Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. Whoa, there it was. Remember, so much of Revelation is we're getting like the curtains open. We're getting a glimpse into the spiritual realm. There's things happening on earth and in heaven and there's spiritual things. Some of it's physical. Some of it's like we're trying to decipher all of this. This could very well be a spiritual thing. And God is showing us, I know who belongs to me. And the devil knows who belongs to him. He has marked it. God's got a seal. The devil only has a mark. It's temporary, okay? So, but God's got a seal. Okay, so this very well could be a spiritual thing, friends. So let's not get worked up into a frenzy of what it could be. Maybe it is a piece of technology. Who knows? Maybe it will be a chip that goes into somebody's hand. But can I just say this? If I get a chip in my hand, would that bother you? If I got a chip 
in my hand, do you think I would lose my salvation? My salvation is not determined on a chip in my hand. My salvation is determined on what Jesus did on the cross. Okay, it's important we understand this. You cannot accidentally fall out of salvation, just like you can't accidentally fall into salvation, okay? So if I'm doing things that could potentially be used as the, the mark of the beast in the future, I'm still okay because my heart is in the right place. It's all about who or what I worship with my life. My life, my heart belongs to God. And if I accidentally do that, uh-oh, I'm just gonna like, if I'm alive around this time, you're alive, just flee from the mountains. Like, like the Bible says over and over again, flee, flee, run from the mountains. Don't worship the beast. That's all you got to do. Just don't worship the beast. If you accidentally have the mark, just don't, just don't worship the beast and you're okay. Just keep worshiping Jesus. See, we got nothing to fear, friends. We got nothing to fear. This is helping some of you. See, our focus is not the Antichrist and what he's going to do. Our focus is Jesus Christ. That's what we keep looking to. That's what we put our trust in. This is what we see all throughout Revelation. So today, as we, we come to the end of season two of Apocalypse, which has been a fun, a fun season uh, of this journey through Revelation, we're gonna hit the pause button today. We're coming back in the fall. But this is important for us to continue to circle back because Revelation is all about Jesus. It's not about end times events and, and marks of the beast and antichrist. It's all about Jesus. Our focus is on him. So let's look at verses 7 and 8 there in chapter 13 as we bring this to a close. Verse 7, he, the Antichrist, was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them, and he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the book of life, belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Do you catch those words? There is a book, it's called the book of life and it belongs to the lamb, Jesus. That's what we call it, the lamb's book of life. And my prayer is that your name is in it. And what's interesting is that God had this plan set up from the beginning of time. From the beginning of creation, he knew that he was gonna send his son Jesus to the cross to take care of this sin issue for us. None of this has caught him off guard. None of what's going to happen in the future is going to catch him off guard. It might catch some of us off guard. It's not going to catch God off guard. God has had a plan all along, and it's to point us to his son, Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And I pray that you put your trust in him if you never have, so that your name is in the book of life. Can I just say that 100 years from now, it won't matter how any of this shakes up. It won't matter how rich or poor or what your life experience was. Maybe you had an easy life. Maybe you had an extremely difficult life. But all that matters 100 years from now is was your, was your name in the Lamb's book of life. That's all that matters, friends. This is a very important book. And so I pray that you would worship Jesus. Worship him. Because that affects not just your experience in this life, but also your eternal life.